All right, welcome back for the Nifty. It's trading just a tad below that 8,300 mark, a cut of nearly about a half a percent. By the way, watch for what's happening across the Asian market screen. Shanghai, which has seen a rally of more than 40 percent so far this year, is getting unwound. But CNBC TV 18's Farah Bukwala Vora is speaking to Siddharth Lal. The strategy that you're adopting here, and how does this fit in with your global expansion plans as well? Yeah, um, you know. In India, we've been doing leisure motorcycling for 60 years now, and we've really grown that market. That's something that we've been working on for a long time. And it's, it's uh, but what we found in in leisure motorcycling is that our customers and even others who they find that there's a lack of really good gear. So hmm. in so what we've done is at the one level to mm. in order to make the motorcycling experience much more fun mm. it's not just the lovely motorcycles that we make but it's also really nice gear so it's it's performance gear which is fully armored it's urban gear mm. which is mm. which is good for city riding conditions and all of that so we've got now a full uh, range of gear mm. which is for the motorcyclists in India and around the world and that helps us in that that allows us to be in lovely locations like this in Khan Market. So we're able to open a store in the middle of Khan Market because it's primarily a gear store which is not just for motorcyclists. You can also wear it like, you know, this t shirt here or you can wear it you can wear it out. So so that's the retail strategy. We've got around six exclusive gear stores um, mm. in India. we we're also retailing our gear through 250 of our dealerships yeah. in India. Yeah. We're also online at okay. store.royalenfield.com. We're also international in 50 countries, approximately 50 countries this summer sure. onwards. Sure. So, big focus on gear and retail. Absolutely. Now, you know, you've also been looking at uh, uh, hiring a lot of new talent into Royal Enfield, and the latest has been Mr. Rudhavid Singh. Uh, where does he step in and where does he take on? What is his role going to be like? And does that mean that you're going to take a back step from Royal Enfield and perhaps uh, focus more on Aisha? Is that what it is looking like? Well, Rudy's joined us at the start of this year and he's the president of the Royal Enfield business mm -hmm. and he's uh, come from a Unilever background, but but mainly he's a you know brand and commercial oriented uh, guy. So what we've the the job that he has is basically the entire commercial side, the entire strategic side, including a product strategy, including new business, so all this retail development, all an uh, international play. That's all comes under Rudy's. Uh, you know, let's say expertise area, and that's where I wasn't doing too well in any case. So, so, so he's going to really come in and sort of step up that entire game, including aftermarket and service. So that's the larger play. Um, I plan to ride a lot more. I plan to, of course, be as involved. In fact, even more so in motorcycling, because, because in fact, in other businesses we have. I'm on the board of the other businesses, but I'm not running our truck or our other JV. So, so really, I'm focused on motorcycles for now and for the future, as I can see it. But. But Rudy fills in an extremely important place in Royal Enfield's future. Yeah. Okay. Now, you know, you're in the throes of a larger global expansion drive. You're present across 50 countries, as you mentioned. However, if you see your exports, it's barely 2% of the total volumes that you do. What's the larger vision out there? And by 2020, where do you see the, sh the mix between domestic and exports? Uh, how, does, how would that pan out? Yeah, so we are present in a lot of countries, but, but the focus now and the new international strategy is on depth. So what we see is that there is an enormous gap globally in the middleweight motorcycle market. So, the uh, you know the the products that are available are actually not very inspiring, not very fun. So what you have is in in the world you have 50 million motorcycles selling every year, which are small motorcycles, and you have a million which are big motorcycles above 750 cc. But 250 to 750 should be around, in my view, 10 million. But it's only one, wow. one million. So we think that the market is underserved. It could be expanded a lot with better products, with better experience, and that's where we fit in. Sure. So we, we are playing that market. We are, you know, we are, I believe, being disruptive in that market globally. But they are still very small and very early days for us at an international level. We've done a good job here in India, but now we are working our way up. So the so we've got a lot of things going on in our international markets. We're developing a lot of new motorcycles. We're doing a lot of international distribution and retail. And over the course of the next five, seven, ten years, we expect to become a significant player in the middleweight market in all the countries that we enter and eventually to lead the middleweight market and eventually to grow the size of the middleweight market. And, and of course, that will mean that a proportion of international sales will grow, but that's again not a focus because India is also growing tremendously. So, so it's not about proportion as much as about presence in international markets as well. Absolutely. So, but as you look at penetrating deeper into both developed and developing markets, are the approaches any different? 
Sure, the approaches are different because in, in emerging markets like in Latin America, Southeast Asia, what we're doing is we're actually tapping on an existing commuter base to upgrade. Okay. And that's what we've done really well in India already, right? Yeah. So, so it's a similar strategy. Of course, it's different because our, because there's a different idea in some sense, but, but the concept is similar and we expect, in fact, there, there to be, you know, a much bigger market in emerging markets. Now, in our, heritage markets of UK, led by UK and then Europe and US, really what we're seeing is much more urbanization, in fact a little bit of downsizing from big, heavy, expensive, unwieldy motorcycles, yeah, those, those ones which are, and two more fun, practical city plus highway motorcycles. So that's the space that we're addressing. So on, on the one side we're pulling the market from commuter up, on the other hand, we're moving the market a little bit from big motorcycles down and we think it's a very happy space in between and that's where we're going to be, the so middle path. There's a lot of talk about two new platforms coming in and completely replacing the 50-year-old iconic platform that you've been working with for so many years now. Give us an update on that. When can we expect the new platform and what would it mean for your new future products? Yeah, so, uh, so our idea is to, in fact, add to our existing range of motorcycles with two new platforms and they will be middleweight motorcycles right so we're not looking at going out of that spectrum okay. and of course we think that some of our motorcycles are maybe slightly underpowered for highway use in international markets because okay. they want to be going just a bit quicker on highways so so we are doing you know some on the upper end of the middleweight market we're doing some on the on the lower end but but generally we're going to be from 2016 onwards you're going to see many more motorcycles coming out from Royal Enfield in the middleweight market through 2017, 2018 and 2020. So we have a long range plan. You're going to see lots of nice Let's motorcycles. Start with the Himalaya. Ah. <laughs> You're going to find out for that, yeah. All right, okay. Yeah. Also, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, we must ask you about, uh, you know, what, what do you do with this retail strategy that you have adopted now? Uh, it's supplemented with an online strategy as well. How is that shaped out in India? Well, the online is still fledgling for us. It's a, it's a store for gear. Mm. And, and really the perspective is that, you know, the availability of the entire selection of our gear is not going to be there around the country and this is right now India but we're going to expand our online presence globally as well so uh, so right now it's really from an availability perspective so a guy in a particular town who's a big enthusiast of motorcycles he doesn't have the store sure. he can certainly get it but also in you know in Delhi for example everyone's not going to come to Khan market a lot of people are I think because it's quite central but a lot of people are not so it's easy to you know access our store online so it's basically an omni-channel model that we're going to follow over time which is going to be both online and offline as well yeah now you recently acquired harris performance as well and you know we've seen your recent efforts at bolstering your r d capabilities uh, are you looking at more acquisitions that would be value accretive or do you think that this is the end as far as acquisitions in the in the short term go it's not really the start of the end it's, it's not an acquisition strategy that mm -hmm. the reason why we acquired harris it was more a talent acquisition. So it's not a business acquisition as such. So basically it's an extremely strong team of Alright, that's about Aisha Motors, a stock which has seen a rally of 20% in 2015, a rally of 250% in the last one year, and its market cap in nearly 50,000 crore rupees is now chipping in the heels of Hero Motor Corp as well. But by the way, focus on what's happening across uh, you know the Asian markets.